Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. If we had nothing in this life, no friendly relations, no provisions, no home, no belongings, and yet we had you, and forgiveness of sin through the gospel and an eternal inheritance, truly we would have everything. Oh God, help us to consider the loss of temporal things as no loss indeed. Pray that you would grant us, even this morning, by your word, an eternal perspective that grants us a vision of eternity as infinite gain. God, we ask that you would help us this morning by the power of your spirit and through your own words to cling to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 8, and we'll continue our exposition of this marvelous chapter. We make comparisons often. I think the older you get, the more you begin to compare people to other people you've known. My wife and I regularly have conversations like, oh, doesn't that person remind you of so-and-so? We make comparisons to things that are familiar with us to other things. That man is built like an ox. I don't know that I've ever seen an ox. You remember William Perry? He was a lineman turned running back for the 1985 Chicago Bears. He was compared to a kitchen appliance, William the Refrigerator. We measure the power in our vehicles by comparing them to horses. Perhaps a little strange in our day. You know, if you had a, a horse-drawn carriage, you would say it was one horsepower. Uh, there's a certain Chevrolet in the parking lot that is known to have 500 horsepower under the hood. That's a lot of horses, and I don't know how they all fit in there. If you were a kid, you may have heard this expression, your room looks like a pigsty. All of a sudden, your room got compared to the domicile of swine. There is a comparison that we as the children of God ought not make. And it is the theme of our passage this morning. And it is a comparison between suffering now and glories to come. And it's tempting for us to think of our sufferings in terms of a comparison to what lies on the other side for us. What I'm going through right now is really hard, but, but there's heaven. And what our passage this morning is going to teach us is that such comparisons are off limits if we truly understand eternal glory. That present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. This morning we look at one verse, Romans 8.18. And the theme of this verse is simply this. For the children of God, present suffering and eternal glory make an unworthy comparison. And we're going to look at this verse in those parts this morning. I want to begin by reading, starting in verse 9 through verse 18 of Romans 8. The great doctrine of the sonship of God, those who belong to God through the gospel, permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Paul writes of such, verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if... By the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. 
For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the children of God, present suffering and eternal glory make an unworthy comparison. Christian suffering is par for the course. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have entered into a life that is, to one degree or another, marked by various kinds of suffering. And we might think for a moment that such suffering threatens the idea of our sonship to God. If I truly am an adopted child of the king of the universe, why do I suffer? I mean, why do the king's kids have no shoes or no food or no respect? in the king's world. I don't know if you've ever had thoughts like this. I belong to God. Well, why would God let these things happen to me if I'm his child? And we need to understand the place of suffering in the Christian life and the place of suffering in terms of the totality of your life on into eternity. Let's talk about present suffering. Paul tells us, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. Everybody suffers. Everybody suffers in one form or another, to one degree or another. And as the Apostle Peter said, we should not consider sufferings as some strange thing. Sufferings are not foreign to us. Even persecutions are not foreign to the Christian life. Notice in verse 17 that if indeed we suffer with him, that is, with Christ, we may also be glorified with him. And Paul may have in view in verse 17 something of what it means to be associated with Christ and to suffer as those who are associated with Christ. But in verses 19 and following, Paul goes on to detail the kinds of suffering that are just par for the course of living in a broken world. A world cursed by God, a world post-Genesis 3, a world after the fall, a world marked by sickness and disease, natural disasters and death, a world marked by rust and decay and the second law of thermodynamics. Stuff in our world simply falls apart. And Romans 8.18 is right in the middle of these two realities, suffering with Christ as a Christian and the whole creation suffering and groaning under the pains of living in a fallen world. We suffer in this suffering sandwich. We suffer at times for being associated with Jesus Christ and we suffer at times simply because we live in a broken, fallen, and cursed universe. And the sufferings we experience take on many forms, sadness, sickness, persecution, loneliness, aging, sometimes chronic physical malady, the kind that seems like it will never end, the loss of loved ones, financial hardship. Sometimes we suffer through personal sacrifice where we choose to give up things for the benefit of others. Think of our missionaries who have given up significant comfort and convenience, predictability, stability, in order to take the gospel to people who have not yet heard. And we suffer privation. Paul said he suffered the loss of all things, all things that had been dear to him at one point in his life. He chalked it up as loss in order to gain Christ. Sometimes we suffer from the consequences of our own sin. We suffer, no doubt, in our fight with sin. 
cutting off hands and gouging out eyes and making no provision for the flesh. There are things we do that might seem painful and come at some cost to us in order to fight sin and corruption in our own hearts and lives. We can suffer via God's loving discipline. And we suffer when we experience compassion. That is the feeling of passion alongside of somebody else, weeping with those who weep, bearing with one another's burdens. We suffer together. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer together. Some can be overcome by inexplicable sadness, mental confusion, and emotional darkness. This suffering is a platform for the work of the Holy Spirit to produce assurance of salvation in the life of a believer. The connection between suffering and assurance and sonship and the indwelling Holy Spirit in Romans 8 becomes critical for us. Because Paul's argument about suffering and what suffering does in us and God's purpose in suffering actually is designed by God to produce assurance of salvation. And when the indwelling Holy Spirit in a believer groans, longing for something yet to come, and when the created order around us groans, longing for something yet to come, and the believer inwardly groans, longing for a glorification to come, these are indicators that a believer is in sync with God's purposes for reality. You see, there are a number of ways to respond to suffering. The groaning three times over, verse 22 of creation, verse 23 of the Christian, and verse 26 of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8 will unfold these in weeks to come. But these are appropriate responses to suffering. When we suffer, we do not just glibly say, oh, it's nothing. No, inwardly we groan, longing in anticipation of something else to come. Why and how does a Christian groan under suffering? He groans because his real life is not yet in place. The Holy Spirit knows this. The created universe knows this. The Christian's longing is in accord with the truth that God and creation both know. And the Christian lies in eager anticipation of what lies in store. This is not true for those who are merely in the flesh. Those who do not have the guarantee of eternal life through Jesus Christ respond to suffering differently. In Philippians 3, Paul describes those who have their minds set on this age, their minds set merely on this world. He says their God is their appetites. In other words, what do they worship? What do they bow down to ultimately? Whatever it is that they want. Whatever it is that they are after. Whatever, whatever it is that they crave. That is temporary things. Things that cannot satisfy. They live for the present age. Think about our world today. Our culture is forever looking for that fountain of youth. That elusive remedy to the curse that the cursed world cannot produce. And the world around us tries to squeeze eternal things, lasting things, enduring things, things that only God can provide through the gospel, things that only God can provide in eternity for his children. The world tries to get them at whatever cost with phrases like YOLO. You only live once. Get what you can now. Carpe diem. Our world is set on doing anything that it can to avoid suffering. To avoid suffering. Not to embrace it. And when suffering comes, the world does not see the purpose of suffering to direct our hearts and attention upward, beyond this life, over the sun. No, the world focuses on life under the sun and tries all the harder to remedy suffering using broken tools, phony remedies. Now, the truth is, suffering is a normal part of the Christian life. 
partly because suffering is a normal part of life on this earth, and partly because your affiliation with Christ brings additional suffering. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Will be persecuted. It's inevitable that if you take up your cross and follow Christ, the reproaches that the world has for Jesus will fall on Jesus' followers. You will not rise above the level of your master. If they've hated him, they will hate you as well. This just comes with the territory. And listen, the message that we proclaim as Christians cannot be, if you believe in Jesus, your life will improve. Your self-actualization is on the rise. That is a, a false message, a phony message, not in accord with the Scriptures. Christian, when you suffer, whether suffering for Christ because you're affiliated with Him, or just suffering because you're living in a broken world, as a Christian, you always suffer with Him. That is, He is with you in your suffering. You're not alone in that. And you're also in good company with others who have loved God and suffered in this world. Consider Job. And Job suffered because Satan was scheming against God and God's plan. Satan was, in fact, behind the scenes trying to besmirch God's work in a man's life and trying to set up Job to prove that Job loved stuff rather than God. Joseph, you remember, suffered under grievous injustices. David suffered a lot of things. But we might highlight the fact that David suffered significantly as a consequence of his own sins. Of course, the apostles suffered, most or all of whom were probably martyred. And if you read that great hall of faith in Hebrews 11, and that long list of people who didn't receive everything in this life because they were looking forward to a greater glory. They suffered. The early church knew what it was to suffer. Under the pagan governments, Roman emperors like Nero and Domitian and Trajan and Marcus Aurelius and Decius and Diocletian, a, a whole host of series of administrations in Roman government that set their minds and wills and government enterprises against the church. Nero famously impaling Christians on poles and lighting them on fire for his garden parties. I think throughout the history of the church, those who loved the gospel and suffered for it in the days of the Inquisition, in the days of Bloody Mary... In the days of gospel expansion, you could think of Nate Saint and Jim Elliott and the others who were speared through on the banks of the Kure River in Ecuador. I think of Chinese pastors in prison during the Cultural Revolution who spent decades in solitary confinement. Their public ministries over and their private ministries began as they couldn't talk to anybody, only talk to God for decades. And they prayed. And heaven knows the fruits of their labors. Many throughout church history have suffered for Christ. And many today are suffering persecution and martyrdom simply because they are loyal to Christ. And these things are by and large foreign to us because of the time and place God has placed us in his providence. With unbelievable freedoms. Those days might change for us. To one degree or another, all Christians suffer with Christ. And all Christians in their suffering have one who is near to the brokenhearted. The Lord Jesus Christ, who knew suffering greater than all others. And the author of this verse, the Apostle Paul New suffering. His words here are not a mere platitude. Chin up. Don't worry about your suffering. Be happy. 
Paul's words here are not hypothetical ideas concocted in a faculty lounge of some institution, isolated and insulated from the pains and difficulties of real life. Paul probably wrote Romans a year or two after he wrote 2 Corinthians. And I want to just get a glimpse through Paul's own eyes, his own experiences with suffering, so that we don't take his words in Romans 8.18 lightly or as someone removed from real suffering. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, verse 4, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Look down at verse 8 of 2 Corinthians 1. We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Paul knew what it meant to suffer and to suffer significantly. Turn a couple pages forward to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Perhaps this list is familiar to you already. Paul describes his suffering. In verse 23, he speaks of labors, imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who's weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? The Apostle Paul was no stranger to suffering. He doesn't speak these comforting words in Romans 8.18 as one who has just studied suffering from a distance. But he has been intimately acquainted with sorrow, grief, despair, physical pain. And notice Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, of this now age, he says literally, and this now age, this present age, often in the New Testament refers to the evil nature of the world in its present form. Things here are not as they should be. This is a world ruled by the God of this world, small g, Satan, And God is sovereign over all these things, but he has caused this present age temporarily to be a time of suffering. For the child of God, present suffering and secondly, eternal glory make a sorry comparison. Let's look at this eternal glory Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Glory is the the common word for glory in the New Testament, meaning brightness, the, the radiation of light. It is the brilliant, outshining, radiating light of the glory of God. All of God's significance and his excellencies, his attributes, shining out in unseeable brilliance, unapproachable light. 
What would it be like to be in the presence of the outshining radiance of the glory of God? Well, Peter, James, and John caught a glimpse in Matthew 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration. There, Jesus was transfigured before them. That is, the glory of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God in the flesh on that mountain. His human flesh was sort of peeled back, as it were, so that those three disciples got to see brilliant glory. And they said, it's good for us to be here. Paul caught a glimpse of heaven. He talks about being uh, elevated, whether in a vision or physically, he didn't know, but to the third heaven. That is not the sky, not space, but the very throne room of God where God's manifest presence is visible. And Paul said he got to experience things there he couldn't tell us about. He spoke of the surpassing greatness of that vision. In fact, I think the vision that Paul saw in 2 Corinthians 12 was fuel for him to endure the kinds of sufferings he endured described in 2 Corinthians 11. In fact, the vision was so great that God gave Paul a thorn in his side that Paul pleaded with God three times to be removed, a messenger of Satan. And God put that in place in Paul's life to keep him humble because of how great the vision was. Notice what Paul says about the glory here. It is a glory that is to be revealed to us. And the New American Standard Bible, the ESV, the Holman Christian Standard all say to us. Uh, several Bible translations, about the other half of the English translation, say the glory is to be revealed in us. NIV, King James, New King James, and others. Which is it? Is it to us or in us? Is this glory of God, the, the intrinsic glory of God that we just get to see or is it some sort of glory that is transferred to us, the glory that is to be revealed in us? And the reason the translations kind of go one of two different ways is there's not a good way in English to explain what's going on here. It is a, a simple Greek preposition that most often is just translated into. This glory of God is to be revealed into us. That's just kind of awkward in English. But the glory that's described here is a glory that is not merely shown to us, but also given to us. God's intrinsic glory is that radiating brilliance of the sum total of His attributes shining out from His very presence. And yet, believers are said to be glorified. And the glory of God's children is a given glory. Not an intrinsic glory, not an inherent glory. We weren't born with this. It is a glory given by grace. One commentator says, this is a glory of which we are not mere spectators. That's right. We will be in the very presence of the glorious one, and we will be glorified. Listen to the Apostle John in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And Paul says similarly in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Do you realize that your life right now is not revealed the essence of who you are, what you are like, what you are destined to be for all of eternity is still concealed. In Colossians 3.1, it is hidden with Christ in God. And when Jesus Christ is revealed in all of his glory, you too will be revealed. There are things hidden now that will be seen and experienced later. The prophet Daniel described this in Daniel 12, 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is what we were destined for. And you remember the scene where Moses went up on the mountain and, and he met God, even speaking with God as a man does face to face. After being in the presence of, the, of God on the mountain, his face 
shone. It radiated. It glowed. So much so that the people said, uh, Moses, could you cover that up? A glory that emanated from God and made Moses' face to shine. How much more so when we are sinless, resurrected, in his presence forever and ever? This is a glory that emanates from God, envelops us, includes us, transforms us. To have a resurrection body fit for such a state, to be conformed to Christ in our material being and our immaterial being, outer man, inner man, resembling the second person of the Trinity. This passage of assurance of salvation is bracketed in verse 18 and verse 30 by this idea of glory. Our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And that section concludes in verse 30 with this thought that all whom God has predestined, and the ones he predestined, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son. All those whom he predestined, he also called. All those whom he called, he also justified. All those whom he justified, he also what? Glorified. Glorified. And we'll get to this, but a past tense verb describing a future reality because it is so certain in the mind and plan and purpose of God that it is as good as done for you, believer. This is exciting to look forward to. And we're not the only ones that look forward to it, as we'll look at next week, beginning in verse 19. The anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And the universe is personified to be craning its neck, looking forward to the day when Christians look like Jesus. That's what it means for the sons of God to be revealed. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, but we are not yet what we shall be. And the universe is looking forward to the day when the image bearers of God bear that image correctly. When man, as God's designed sub-regent over the created order, rules and reigns over that creation appropriately with selfless love, with an eye to the glory of God and service to Him. When man has dominion in the way that he is supposed to, every square inch of the universe will feel and benefit from the restoration of man. It's a glory we look forward to. It's a glory the spirit within us groans towards. And even the created universe around us looks forward to it. For the children of God, present suffering and eternal glory make for an unworthy comparison. Let's think about this comparison for just a moment. First of all, Paul says in verse 18, For I consider... This is a word which means, I reckon. It's a word for mathematical calculation, to to work something out to precision. And Paul is sort of doing some math here to calculate, uh, how do my sufferings now compare with eternal glory? And his conclusion is simply this, they don't. They don't compare. Your sufferings are not worthy of comparison. They're not worthy to be placed in the same sentence as the glory that is to be revealed in you. Paul says, I consider that present suffering and eternal glory are not worthy to be compared. This comparison is not mathematically possible. How much bigger is infinity than a finite number? Do the math. It's incalculable. It's immeasurable, and pick as big a number as you can think of and put it on one side and put infinity on the other side, put a minus sign in between them, and what do you get? It's still infinity. It cannot be measured. The math is impossible. It's not right to say, you know, eternal glory will be more significant than present trials. Uh, That's not right. You know, Mount Everest is bigger than a bowl of Cheerios. 
I'm looking at a bowl of Cheerios and I'm going, how big is Mount Everest? Well, it's bigger than this bowl of Cheerios. That's the wrong comparison. And, and, and that comparison is a comparison between two finite things. If you wanted to count the Cheerios in your bowl at breakfast time, you could actually count that number. And if given enough time, if you wanted to count up all the neutrons and protons and electrons that make up Mount Everest, that also is a finite number that could be counted. And the proportions between them are staggering. But the proportions between present suffering and eternal glory are immeasurably staggering, so much so that they should not be compared in the same sentence. They cannot be put on the same scale and weighed out, measured out, or calculated. The disproportion is infinite. This glory that is to be revealed has no limit. And know this, Christian, by the kindness of God, your sufferings are limited. They're limited here kindly by the compassion of our God, limited in time, limited in scope, limited in degree. They're limited to what we in God's strength and in his purpose can bear. They're limited to what suits our good. We're going to learn this when we get to 828. And they're limited to what accords with God's glorious purposes. And notice how Paul describes these sufferings, the, pre, the sufferings of this present time. That is, the, the sufferings here are impermanent. They come to an end. The New American Standard words it this way, the, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. And, and there's an important verb in the original that's sort of missed in this English translation, and it is a, a verb that means uh, it is about to be. It is about to be. That is its future, but it is inevitable and imminent. That means there's no way it's not going to happen. This glory will be revealed, and listen, it's right around the corner. It's coming. And if you think, oh my goodness, if, if I have to endure the aging process until I die, and you will, I don't know if I can take it. The last time I got a cold, it seemed like forever, and I forgot what it was like to feel well. And, and you think of our friends who suffer constant physical malady. You think about degenerative illnesses that are only ever going to get worse in this life. You think about the, the pain and difficulty of things like Alzheimer's or cancer. You have to know that this glory is about to be revealed. It's inevitable. And it's imminent. It's right around the corner. This glory that is to be revealed in us, revealed to us, it, it never ends. It will never be tarnished. It will never be diminished. It can never be taken away. It will never fade. And so imagine a great pair of scales where you're going to weigh things out and compare them. Put all of your sufferings on one side and put eternal glory on the other. You see, your glory does not make up for your suffering. Your eternal glory does not balance out your sufferings. Glory demolishes the scales entirely. Eternal glory makes present suffering less than insignificant. Present sufferings are zeros on the scales when compared to the eternal weight of glory. And so they are not worthy to be compared. Not worthy to be on the scales. Not worthy to be in the same sentence. And listen, it is not that present sufferings are nothings. The word suffering is used here. In a parallel passage in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, Paul uses the word affliction. It's real, it's hard, you feel it, it's tangible, it weighs us down. Sometimes these are heavy and long-lasting. And listen, you don't get a right perspective on suffering until you weigh them in the balance against eternity. Our 
I want us to think about how to think about Romans 8.18 for a few moments. We're not glorified yet, and we live here, and we suffer, and we will suffer yet. And in this room, there are friends who suffer now. And I want us to think carefully about how we employ this truth broadly uh, in, in the lives of others and for our own hearts. And I want to take a moment just to, to think, first of all, about the phony Christian message that's really popular in our day, in our country, when there's no persecution and, and we can get away with singing silly little songs. Uh, we can get away with thinking about the gospel and benefits to our lives in ways that maximize our self-esteem and our potential and uh, give us a desire to follow our, our own hearts and fulfill our dreams and uh, live out the good American life by the power of the gospel, these kinds of things. Listen, you can't live that kind of theology under persecution. You couldn't live that kind of theology for most of the history of the church and for many places where the church lives today. I had a friend in Russia who's a pastor whose family suffered for decades and generations. And they had just come out of a heavy time of persecution under communist rule. The Iron Curtain had just been lifted. And American Christianity had not quite yet infiltrated the Russian church. And he said to me, why do you sing those silly little songs? What silly little songs? Oh, all those worship songs you sing at church that are really all about me. I this and I that. And they're not about the glory of God. They're, they're not about the gospel. They're, they're not about sound doctrine. It's all about how you feel and this kind of stuff. Listen, we, we couldn't sing those silly little songs in Russia. People kept disappearing. Churches were emptied of people who preached the gospel. Joel Osteen's church boasts 52,000 people a week in attendance. And perhaps the message of that ministry is easy to pick on because it's so obviously unbiblical, right? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. If anyone is to come after me, you must deny himself. And the message of that ministry is you can be the best you you can have your best life now. Listen, what does the world want? Those who aren't following Christ, they want prosperity now. They want health now. They want success now. They want self-actualization now. That's why television advertising works so well. You'll spend money on things that bring you these things, supposedly, and they fail every time. They can't. Uh, deliver on what they promise. But there's a brand of Christianity that has rebranded Christianity that, that takes the desires of the world and markets Jesus in the packaging of those desires. Hey, your God is your appetites? Guess what? You can worship that God of your appetites and have a little Jesus and those appetites will be more fulfilled. What a tragic, antithetical message to the scriptures. You can make more of yourself. Suit Christianity to the consumer's tastes. Put a little Jesus in your life and you can have what you want. Fulfill your dreams. Be satisfied. Live abundantly. Thrive. Be successful. Maximize your potential. That is not the biblical pattern. The biblical pattern is suffering now, glory later. Not your best life now. That message is fraudulent. It's inoculating, you know, like a, a, a shot that's supposed to inoculate you to a coming disease. That message inoculates people to the gospel message. Oh, yeah, I heard Jesus. I, I tried that thing, and it didn't deliver on what it promised. I ended up suffering. 
I didn't get rich quick. I didn't maximize my potential. My marriage is in shambles, and my kids, it didn't work. People say, well, I had enough of that Jesus stuff. That message can't help in a time of suffering, and it's not true. You see, suffering reveals the heart. It's an indicator of the condition of your insides. <laughs> what do you find inside there when you suffer? Groaning for glory. God, this isn't my home. Here's one more reminder. One more trip to the doctor's office. This isn't where I belong. Does it produce in you anticipation, longing, prayer, evangelism, seeking God? Or does it produce in you complaint? A scurrying to anything under the sun that will help you to avoid suffering now. Do you worship at the altar of a comfortable, easy life? Sacrifice anything to get it. That's what the world does. We've got to recalibrate a theology of suffering from the pages of the New Testament. Let's think for a moment about how to help others with a verse like Romans 8.18. I think what we don't want to do when someone is suffering is say, Romans 8.18. I don't think that's the first thing you want to say. And we'll find this later in, in the book of Romans, to weep with those who weep. It's appropriate. Suffering is real. Suffering is hard. It may be easy for us when things are going well to not understand when someone else is suffering. Maybe to want them, for our own comfort's sake, to just get over it. And that's not appropriate. It's good for us to weep with those who weep, to listen well to sufferers in the midst of their suffering. It would be wrong for us to make light of others' suffering. Remember that sermon from Romans 8.18? Remember the scales? Suffering's nothing. <laughs> Understanding suffering in the scales compared to eternity is different than making light of someone's suffering. Do you understand? It's real. It's heavy. In the end, we want to help people evaluate their suffering in view of eternity. We want to help them toward the God of all comfort. And I think it begins with thinking about suffering for ourselves. Preparing our own hearts to suffer, to suffer well. How do you prepare your heart for suffering? I think you want to fortify your heart with Romans 8, 18 and 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Present suffering is not worthy to compare it with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Light and momentary troubles are producing for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Prepare your heart for suffering by memorizing these texts, rehearsing them to yourself in small sufferings so that they're practiced, rehearsed, and ready for bigger ones. I think we ought to prepare our hearts to accept suffering as from the good hand of God. It's no strange thing to suffer in a broken world, and it's no strange thing to suffer as a Christian in a broken world. Prepare our hearts to allow suffering to produce prayer, longing, and groaning. Be ready for that. It would be great if that were our first response. I'm suffering. Oh, yes, my home is in heaven. It's not often our first response. It would be great to prepare our hearts to suffer well by thinking about how can I comfort others from the platform of suffering when God might provide it. Right? Read 2 Corinthians 1. Paul suffered and saw it not as about him, but as about a platform for him to know how to comfort others when they suffered. I don't think Job's suffering was all about Job, nor Joseph's. 
nor David's, nor Paul's. These things were written for us, for our benefit. If Job could know the fruit of his suffering in the lives of the people who read of God's kindness on the pages of the book named after him, I think he would be encouraged. Thankful for the way Jake and Matt years ago read a book called Don't Waste Your Cancer by John Piper and and prepared themselves to live the way that they have lived for our benefit long before the suffering came. Suffering ought to produce evangelism. In other words, when you suffer, others are watching. Why is so-and-so suffering like that? I don't get it. Oh, I'd love to tell you. My home is in heaven. My sins are forgiven. I deserve far worse. Let me tell you about the grace of God and the love of God. Jesus said in Luke 6, 22, rejoice when you're persecuted. Rejoice when you're suffering. Be mindful that suffering reveals your heart. It's an opportunity to purify your affections. You ever pray, God, I want to be more mature. I want to grow in Christ. Um, How does a believer become more mature? James 1, whenever you encounter various trials. Oh, that's right. My heart is on display in a trial under suffering. It's like my heart beating inside my chest gets out in front of me and I can look at it, I can see what it's doing. How does my heart respond when I don't get what I think I want or what I thought I deserved? Oh, this is a great opportunity to work on some things I couldn't see before. Suffering is also an opportunity to recall the closeness with God joy, peace, and selflessness that past trials produced. Oh, I remember that trial. Remember how close I was to God back then? (laughs) Remember what my prayer life was like? Remember what what an encouragement I was to the people around me because I was in a trial. God, when's the next one? Remember what Remember how hard it was to come by those things in season of prosperity? How hard it was to come by closeness with God, earnestness in prayer, when everything was going great. Remember the promise in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, that present affliction is producing for you an eternal weight of glory. There is an organic relationship between your sufferings here and glory that is to come. It's a reminder again that we actually deserve far worse than we get. And suffering puts us in a category that Christ was in. He suffered. The pattern of his earthly existence was suffering and then glory. To experience that same pattern is to be like our Savior. And remember always that Christ is with you, believer. If you're not a Christian this morning, um, you are free from the persecutions that come with being associated with Christ. And maybe those have kept you from surrendering to Christ. Hey, you know what? I don't want to be thought of the way Christians are thought of, so I don't want to associate with them. And maybe if you were in a Muslim world, the the threat of severe persecution might keep you from following Christ. But you still live in a broken world filled with sorrows and sin and lies and ultimately death. It's inevitable that you will encounter suffering, even if you don't know Christ. And you likely already have. My encouragement to you is that if you choose to suffer with Christ here, you have infinite glory in the life to come. If you reject Christ here in this life in order to maintain some illusion of comfort, some illusion of happiness, some illusion of so-called freedom, then your best days on into eternity 
are only here in a broken world. You will only face suffering forever under the wrath of God. You may have been tempted to resist God because of suffering in this world. I would never worship a God who allowed tsunamis, cancer, and terrorist attacks. Maybe your own suffering has caused you to distrust God, to deny His existence, or even to admit His existence and hate Him. But you need to know your only hope for escape from suffering is this God whom you are resisting. And he offers you himself and sonship and an eternal inheritance that will not fade away and infinite happiness in the presence of his glory. It's what humanity was made for. It is what sinful humanity has run from. And he does this through the death of his own son who came and suffered in the place of sinners in a way no one will ever suffer under the infinite wrath of his Father to actually pay for sins he never committed as a substitute to bring us to himself. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to earth as a baby at Bethlehem to suffer the incongruities of having made the universe and being despised by the people in it. While you walked on this earth to suffer the hardships of earthly life and then to suffer at the hands of men, injustice, betrayal, torture, murder, and to suffer under your holy Father all the wrath that sinners deserve. All so that we could have a guarantee of eternal life and glories to come. Oh, how we long for the day when we will show up in your presence glorified. When the sufferings of this present time fade into nothingness because of the greatness of the glory which we receive. 